Hello everybody and welcome to Pisa Presents with Zafactinus. I don't think we're in the Cretaceous anymore. This is going to be a look into some of the aquatic organisms and related ones in the Western Interior Seaway. In terms of what that is, well, let's look into that. But first, a slight warning for my audience. My cat has just walked into the room, and the viewers for the Tully Monster one recently uh, may remember him as being quite vocal. So if anybody hears the yowlings of a cat that appears to be in torment in the background, he is fine, I promise. He just gets very jealous when I do these. So now, when I told a bunch of coworkers that I was going to do one of these are in Kansas this weekend, the, well, the reaction was pretty much the same thing. Like, Kansas? Folks were all just, well, what the heck type of fossils can you get out there? Because sadly, there's a lot of stereotypes about Kansas in terms of the paleontology. And yes, okay. And the cat is now starting up. I am so sorry. So now, yeah, when people think about Kansas, it's the tornadoes or say, the Wizard of Oz type stuff, or even a few people are like Smallville and Superman. People don't really think of, or even realize, sadly, the great and massive fossil diversity that Kansas offers the rest of the world. I mean, you don't think of places like Castle Rock State Park, or Chalk Rock Canyon, or even Monument Rocks. People don't even know that a lot of these places exist, which is an incredible shame. So I hope to at least bring awareness of some of these places and some of these organisms to you today. So let's begin our story in the Cretaceous period. So this is about 145 to 65 million years ago. So now you can see here, we're gonna start at about 150 million years ago and then up to 100, and then at 50. So our continents are roughly in the same position that we know and love them for being right now. Now, well, at least they are in terms of, well, general position. What they're beneath at that time is an entirely different matter because after all, like I said, the Western Interior Seedway, well, that does imply that it's under a bit of water. Well, definitely. So now Monument Rocks, for example. So let's look into some of these places particularly. So now this is comprised of the Niobara Chalk Formation, which is in turn the Smoky Hill Chalk Member. That is the big one. That is what is called a Lagerstata which in paleontology speak, that is something that is so fossil rich, it's more or less a mother load of fossils. It is just something that contains so many fossils of such diversity and such exceptional preservation that it is just the be all and end all of exceptional preservation sites. It's very, very amazing to go to and to see. Now, when it was forming, all of this was actually forming amazingly at one inch per 700 years, which doesn't really sound like that much, but really when you think about it over the grand scale of geologic time, that's actually pretty fast because of just, you're talking about this sea here and all of these aquatic organisms and everything. So during this time, this whole part of Western Kansas was underneath water. And so all of these organisms were building up all of this soft chalk gradually over here in the inside of this seaway. Now, yes, this chalk isn't quite like the chalk that people are used to on a chalkboard, but still just to give you an idea of if you can picture kind of the chalk that for those of us that still actually grew up with people using chalk on chalkboards when we went to school, that stuff is very soft. And so that is why this place is such an amazing one when it comes to fossils. This isn't say like the Midwest, places like the Badlands and what have you, where people have to very, very carefully remove these fossils from an outer casing of tough, hard rock. They're encased in soft chalk for the most part. It's a very, very soft rock. 
So these fossils are very, very easy to get out, relatively speaking, compared to other counterparts. And now my cat is just banging on the door. I mean, he can just let himself out. How rude. Okay, I am so sorry, everyone. So another reason why these fossils are so soft, too, is because a good portion of this chalk, well, if you think about it, a lot of these soft fossils and these little, a lot of these organisms that were in the water, well, organisms doing what they're doing, well, what do they do? They create waste. So a lot of this chalk also contained a lot of copper lights, which made it even further soft. So not only was this place a site of exceptional preservation, but the rock that it was in was very, very good host for the fossils that it contained. So here is basically, as seen from space, the Western Interior Seaway about 90 million years ago. So you're looking here from roughly the Arctic Ocean to Mexico generally. And some of the critters that we're gonna find here are ones that we've covered in other videos. And when we get to the YouTube upload, yes, I'm gonna link a couple of videos that cover them better here. Like Archelon was, I like prehistoric turtles. We did one on marine reptiles, what have you. So those are gonna get uploaded below the links, but still, we're going to go into a few others more in depth. Now, this whole entire area, this part of Kansas, goes by the rather interesting nickname of what I'll just call Hex Aquarium, because this is, after all, again, a family site and going to get uploaded to YouTube. I'll just call it Hex Aquarium. Now, I'm not a big fan of that nickname for a couple of different reasons. One, it kind of because obviously the adults in the, in the audience sure as anything know what that word is. It sort of implies a not really like a paranormal nature to things, but something that's sort of like scary and nebulous and almost like a Tales from the Crypt type of thing to it. When there is nothing scary or nebulous about any of these animals, these were real, vibrant, living, breathing animals that were in a very dynamic environment. And I don't know, to kind of say almost like through calling it that, I don't know, it almost to me, it gives it a negative implication. Yes, it gives it an implication that attracts the attention and draws your ear to it and then maybe thusly draws more of a, say like a research interest to it. But still, is it the best phrase? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Now, so there are several species of ammonites found in this area, not too many directly within the chalk. They aren't as directly preserved within the chalk, but in surrounding areas, there actually are some more. Now, Archelon just mentioned the giant turtle. There, there are several of them in there as well. Crinoids. Here is an utterly Gorgeous. I mean, just look at that crinoid right there. That is stunning. I mean, wow. That Sorry, I'm just drooling over this crinoid right here. Don't mind me. So now, Dakota Sucus is basically, a, well, it is a relative of Dinosuchus, the giant terror crocodile, more or less, as it's called. Now, that one is on the right. There is a little bit of back and forth online as to whether or not Dinosuchus has been found in Kansas. Officially, the record is no. Dakota Sucus, yes. Dinosuchus, no. So just to keep that straight. Now, on the left, that is what has been found of Dakota Sucus. So you can kind of look at the teeth. We have some vertebra right here. You're looking at a couple other bones as well. But just to give you an example of what some of those things would look like assembled and really how big some of these skulls were of some of these early crocodilians and some of their ancestors and relatives. Now, obviously, this is an elasmosaurus. Now, elasmosaurs are members of the order Plesiosauria, so plesiosaurs. Now, plesiosaurs in general are all over the fossils in this region of Kansas. There are many, many different kinds of plesiosaurs. Now, altogether, 
So how did this come about? Well, this particular specimen that we're going to be concerned with was discovered in 1867 by one Dr. Turner in Logan County. So this Dr. Turner found this absolutely wonderful specimen that actually changed paleontology forever. And it's rather a shame because he does not get the proper credit that he should for it. And he wasn't even the person that gave the name to the species. It was that fellow right there. Now, you may not recognize that picture of him. More popularly, well, the photo that is often given of him is that one. That is actually Edward Drinker Cope. So he got this specimen of this Elasmosaurus, as he wound up naming it. And those that know a little bit about Cope can probably figure out where this is going. And yes, this is that famous specimen. Now, Cope is often given credit for discovering this specimen. He did not. It was actually Dr. Turner. Now, so here it is, an illustration that Cope did himself. Now, big problem with this. Well, very, very large problem with this, of course, is, is that... As a one-time colleague of his, and probably the most frequent guest star in this entire channel, Othniel Charles Marsh pointed out, is, is that, well, um, Cope put the head on the wrong end. And, of course, then famous, famously, the two of them feuded back and forth for years. It caused this giant slog that was called the Bone Wars, and it's actually going to be the subject of our video for uh, New Jersey. And so it was, that was actually a specimen from Kansas that caused that mess. Now, Encodus is an absolutely just, they are so incredibly adorable, these fossils. I just want to pinch them all. Oh my God, they are so cute. They are so freaking cute. I love Encodus. And my cat is staring at me and he is trying to jump on the bed and chest. Oh, crap. Okay, my cat is now next to the computer. All right. Okay. So now there are lots of giant clams that are in this area and also clams and shells of various other sizes as well. You'll see in some sites people try to play it up like, oh, clams the size of a car hood. Not all of them are that big. If you see that, those particular clams were these. The uh, Inoceramid clams were those particular ones that could get very, very large. But no, they weren't really all that big. Now, Hesperornis was a particular seabird that was found a lot in these various formations. Just, you know, fallen in, sadly. Now, Mosasaurs were very, very common in this region. Extremely common. Actually, it was the same year that, or right around the same year that Marsh uh, got involved with a very, very famous discovery. His people uh, found their own uh, very large Mosasaur skeleton in Kansas as well. Othniel Charles Marsh also did a lot of field work in Kansas too. Now, this is obviously a dinosaur. You cannot have land-dwelling dinosaurs, yes, on a seaway so these bodies then drifted into the water and then died and were fossilized there so still dinosaurs have been preserved within this chalk and this is indeed one of them now this is the little one that uh marsh wound up naming pteranodon it was named in 1876 the fossils were actually discovered uh couple of years beforehand, a few years beforehand. Now we're going to look at some sharks that are found from, found in this area. There's all sorts of sharks, but are just, here are some common ones that come about a lot in that found some good photos of. This is the Ginsu shark, as it's properly called, in part because its face comes to a sharp point. It's There are these kind of popular knives for a little bit very briefly and I think it was the 80s or the 90s called Ginsu and that's kind of where it came it got the name so there are also these as well the 
that is actually a tooth. So some of the teeth can be very, very interesting. They can take all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Now, Squalicorax is a shark that I love to bits. They are not only found in the Western Interior Seaway of Kansas, but they are also found in the various fossil creeks of New Jersey. And wow, that was my Pennsylvania Dutch coming out right there, raging. Wow, crick, okay. Now, the Niobaris squid is something whose actual physical look is very much up to debate because obviously, because it's a soft-bodied organism, we don't really know if it looked like that. I mean, it could have, possibly this thing was up to 25 feet long. That's very much up to debate. But, but I mean, it could have, I mean, this thing could have been like purple polka dots and really, we don't really know what it looked like that much. That's the problem with soft body organisms. They just don't fossilize that well. Now, R2, our friend, Zephactinus. So, a little bit of foreshadowing with its mouth open right there. So now, one of the most famous fossil specimens, of, well, the most actually, by far and away, of Zephactinus was discovered in 1952. So the American Museum of Natural History, specifically one gentleman named Walter Sorensen, and so they were working with a very, very famous paleontologist out in Kansas named George Sternberg and they wound up discovering this Zephactinus audax was what it wound up becoming and so at first they had just discovered the tail and then they're digging more and digging more and digging more and they found a 13 foot long specimen with a six foot long gillisus in the inside and yeah, so it's called the fish within a fish. So more or less, best as they can figure out. So this, the Zephactinus ate this other fish shortly before it died. The other fish had not been decomposed. So again, best as they can guess, perhaps maybe the other fish, you know, like, jostling around in there or something else killed as a factinus or I don't know something else might have contributed to its death maybe the fish was too big for it and I don't know it caused some sort of internal trauma who knows but yes this specimen is now the star attraction of the Sternberg Museum of Natural History in Kansas who are absolutely lovely people and I can highly recommend a look at either their, any one of their socials or just their website or really anything that you can get a hold of because they're sweethearts. And that is the specimen right there. And you can kind of see sort of towards the middle. You, you can kind of look at the Zephactinus and then it's like, oh dear, there's another specimen in there. So yeah, that is a fossil that was having a very, very bad day several million years ago. But not having a very bad day. Right here is our pteranodon just looking off into the distance, just stoically, thinking about how awesome it is. So, also awesome, definitely, are the people in the fossils of the very fine state of Kansas. So, thank you very much, folks, for joining us today. I again apologize for my cat always wanting to be the center of attention when he comes into the room when I'm doing these things. So thank you very much and have a lovely weekend now.